As far back as the 1920s, when he began as FBI director, Hoover had gone after persons like Marcus Garvey. Garvey's organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, had a membership numbering in the millions, and somehow Hoover found this threatening and worthy of surveillance and undermining attempts. Garvey's influence had been international and had drawn world attention to America's treatment of black people. Paul Robeson was another who was viewed by Hoover as an enemy. This reporter has personally examined thousands of FBI, CIA, and other U.S. government agency documents that were kept on Paul Robeson. Robeson, like Garvey, had an international audience at his command, and he used that platform to denounce racism in the United States. Most importantly, however, were the questions raised by the State Department as to my political opinion. Here's a question of whether one who wants to sing and act can have, as a citizen, political opinion. And uh, in attacking me, they suggested that when I was abroad, I spoke out against injustices to the Negro people in the United States. I certainly did. And the Supreme Court Justice just ruled, uh, Judge Warren, in the segregation cases, that world opinion had a lot to do with that uh, ruling, that our children, Negro children, can go to school like anybody else in the South. I'm very proud to have been a part of directing world opinion to precisely that condition. The second, that I fight for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa. Uh, Bandung, the colored peoples of the world assembled, made it clear that nobody is going to tell them what to do. They're going to have the independence. I'm proud of that. When the 60s came, many factions of the civil rights movement had developed the same international perspective. Those of us uh, living in the United States who see ourselves as, and who are in fact, you know, descendants of the Africans who were brought to this country, who were enslaved, I mean, and who are rebelling and revolting now against our oppressive condition, and we are concerned about Africa. We see Africa as our motherland, and we feel that we have a responsibility to speak with as much passion as any other African on this issue. The United States government says that change must come in South Africa through peaceful means. That same government has over 500,000 troops in Vietnam fighting not white people, but brown Vietnamese. So it is small wonder that the civil rights movement was also subjected to heavy attack by Hoover. Billions of government dollars were spent in this direction. Many of these activities were not only unwarranted, but of questionable legality. The congressional hearings into the assassination of Dr. King bore this out. Two FBI agents testified before a Senate committee chaired by Senator Frank Church. I'm trying to find out what it was that impelled the, some part of the FBI to pursue Martin Luther King with such an obsession. And what I understood that answer to be is, first of all, it was not any suspicions of the commission of a federal crime. None of the literature showed up a single suggestion that Martin Luther King had committed or was about to commit a crime. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, sir, but at this point, much of what was being done did involve challenges to local laws. And there is a very strong suggestion that King was seen as rallying the lawbreakers and would-be lawbreakers, albeit for a cause that, that, that sounded pure. Looking now in terms of, if we look at what might have gotten the Bureau started. And if we remember, at the same time, he is extremely critical of the Bureau's own law enforcement efforts. And we see throughout these documents and the New Left documents that it is taboo to criticize the Bureau right. and particularly the Director. Well, did he ever, was he ever charged with uh, fomenting violence? Did he, ever, did he ever participate in violence? Was it ever alleged that he was about to be violent? That was no. the very opposite of his philosophy, Senator. So that it was neither the fear of commission of a crime or the commission of violence. Was there any serious charge that he himself was a communist? No such charge ever was made. So that what was left then was a decision on the part of some persons or person within the FBI that he should nevertheless be pursued. And replaced. And the basis for that apparently was political decision that he was dangerous or potentially dangerous to someone's notion 
of what uh, this country should be doing, and a further theory that the FBI possessed the ability to enter into this field and to investigate and to intimidate and seek to neutralize and indeed replace a civil rights leader that they thought to be uh, politically uh, unacceptable. Uh, Is that correct? Yes. Correct. All right. And the tactics they used apparently uh, had no end. Um, microphonic uh, surveillance of hotel rooms. They included um, informants. They included um, sponsoring of uh, letters uh, signed by phony names to relatives and friends and organizers. They involved even plans to replace him with someone else the FBI was to select as a national civil rights leader. Is that correct? Yes, that plan uh, was didn't get very yeah, far. But, but it was seriously considered, and Mr. Hoover penned a note to that suggestion, uh, commending its authors. Did they not? Yes. Right. It also included um, a direct, uh, an indirect attempt to persuade the Pope not to see him. And many other people. A direct attempt to persuade uh, one of our major universities not to grant him a doctorate degree. That's correct. Uh, after the March on Washington, there was an acceleration. He was defined because of his speech in that demonstration in Washington as the most dangerous and effective leader in the country. And there was a paper battle between within the Bureau as to how best to attack him, and he was attacked. Uh, after Time Magazine named him as Man of the Year, again, the Bureau finds that reprehensible, believes it must attack and destroy. Uh, when he was given the Nobel Prize, again, they seek to discredit Dr. King with the persons who welcomed him back from that award. Uh, when he began to speak out against the Vietnam War, there's a new crescendo of efforts by the Bureau to discredit and destroy Dr. King. It is my uh, feeling that the assassination of Dr. King was a part of a conspiracy uh, in the country, and I do believe that uh, some individuals in very high places of our government were involved in this conspiracy. And it is the same conspiracy uh, that eliminated and destroyed President Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, uh, Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, uh, and so many other freedom and human rights individuals. I'm convinced the government was involved at some level. Uh, I will never separate the conduct, the attitude of Hoover and the FBI from Dr. King's assassination. I never will do that. I think one of the most important things that come out in that investigation was that Martin Luther King in Memphis was in a white hotel, and the FBI admitted that they leaked to the press that Dr. King was staying in a white hotel instead of a black hotel, and it was that embarrassment that forced Dr. King to move into the Lorraine Hotel where he was killed. There are more questions regarding the FBI's role in the assassination of Dr. King. For example, why was Dr. King stripped of his protection just before he was killed in Memphis? Reporter Les Payne and myself interviewed police officer Ed Reddit of the Memphis Police Department, who told how he was mysteriously removed from his security post near Dr. King. However, later, his superior, Chief Holloman, denied doing so. Why do you feel you were pulled uh, away from your assignment of surveillance that day? Why, why do you think they pulled you away? I think because whoever pulled the trigger, I could identify When there were complaints from somebody, did we reduce manpower at the Lorraine? Did we reduce manpower in no. the area? No, no. The Attorneys General in 1965 had for 25 years authorized uh, wiretaps in a fairly widespread fashion. This was just one. 
at the very most, the only thing I can think of that I would have done, but I didn't even do that, was go talk to Bob Kennedy and, and uh, ask him about it. But uh, Mr. Katzenbach, in whom I also had great confidence, um, um, without giving me the details, uh, said that it was all right, that he had, um, that there were no, it was not being done anymore, it would not be done anymore, and that uh, there was just nothing to worry about. I think the issue is the neo-fascist police state mentality that pervaded the intelligence community that uh, is a danger to America to this day. Malcolm X was kept under heavy FBI surveillance since he got out of prison back in 1953. As he rose to national prominence as the black Muslim's chief spokesman, he became aware that he was under close watch. Our desire, our prayer, that we can have a peaceful, intelligent rally here this afternoon. But at the same time, we see that they have surrounded us with many of their own agents in uniform and out of uniform. That surveillance escalated into the infiltration of the Nation of Islam. Personal frailties were played upon. Jealousy arose and Malcolm was ultimately ousted from that organization. This caused an intense climate of rivalry that set the stage for Malcolm's assassination in February of 1965. Uh, he was uh, really declared a uh, hypocrite at the time and uh, because of uh, some of the things that uh, he was saying in regards to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, may God be pleased with him, uh, a strong position was really taken against him. Um, the ministers, began to um, speak out against uh, the things that Malcolm was saying in regards to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, accusations that he uh, had made about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, he had uh, accused the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, for instance, of uh, fathering children and et cetera. And uh, you must understand that at that time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to the Muslims then, was held in, in such high reverence as you would even think of any prophet being held in high reverence. And uh, this is the kind of love and admiration that uh, the Muslims at that time had for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when uh, Minister Malcolm began to say those things, uh, it was taken as uh, an outright lie. I would say that, take for instance, um, one time in the uh, Muhammad Speaks at that time, uh, the newspaper printed uh, a big article concerning the chief hypocrite. And it actually had a, a picture of uh, uh, Malcolm's head, you know, rolling or bouncing down, down the street at that time. And, you know, the way that picture is depicted, you know, he has little horns on his head and things like this here. So, indirectly, uh, I would say that a very, very strong position was taken against him. Yes, he's immoral. You can't, you can't take nine teenage women and seduce them and give them babies, and not tell me you're more, and then, then then tell me you're moral. You could do it if you admitted you did it, and admitted that the babies were yours. I'd, I'd shake your hand and call you a man, a good one too. <laughs> but any time you seduce teenage girls and make them be charged with adultery, make them hide your crime, why you're not even a man, much less a, a divine man. <laughs> so. Uh, and, 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 and this is what he did. He took, he took at least nine that we know about. And I'm not speculating because he told this to me himself. Yes, that's why he wanted me dead, because he knew that as soon as I woke up, I'd tell it. plan of action was basically uh, what uh, took place. Uh, me and uh, Leon, we took seats down in the front of the order barn. We came early. Um, we would drift into the uh, order barn. Um, if indeed there was a search, then we could never enter. There was no search, so uh, we drifted in just like uh, we had hoped to. Uh, Leon Davis and myself took seats uh, down front on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, Benjamin and uh, William, William, who carried the uh, sort of shotgun, sat right behind us, you know. And uh, we were sat somewhat uh, in the back, or almost in the middle. And our plan was, as soon as uh, the uh, brother came out to speak, 
that uh, Wilbur would throw the uh, smoke bomb to make a dis distraction, and that uh, Wilm would uh, fire his uh, shotgun, and that uh, Leon and myself, we would uh, fire our weapons, and then this uh, break for the door. And when I get in there with you, I bring before you the Lord of and I pray that you and I will listen, listen, hear, and understand. Thank you. As in Dr. King's assassination, a police superior has trouble with the truth. He tells reporters that two suspects were arrested at the Audubon. Later, official police reports say that one was arrested. Also, listen closely as the police official carefully handles the question about police on the scene. We have two suspects in custody now. Well, where were they arrested? Who fired the shot? I wouldn't know that at this time. Where were they arrested, sir? One of uh, these men uh, was arrested uh, on the street by one of our patrolmen close by. There were no police at this meeting, were there, Inspector? There were no uniformed policemen assigned inside this ball. No uniform police on the scene. Does this mean that police out of uniform were there? And if so, why didn't they take action? What were they doing there? This behavior pattern rings a bell of striking similarity with the behavior pattern of the CIA overseas. The church committee produced cables, demanded and got cables, which proved it traced the CIA's plan to kill Lumumba. Sid Gottlieb went, got on a plane and went to Leopoldville. Headquarters sent a cable saying, use the poison. Gottlieb was couriering the, uh, for the poison. The headquarters sent a cable saying, you have to use it promptly because it deteriorates. And they had a plan to try and get it into his toothpaste or give it to him in a mickey at some social function. And uh, then there's a gap, and no cables, no explanation of what happened. Then uh, five weeks later, he's beaten to death on an airplane. And uh, unfortunately, though, the, the, the airplane was in the control of people who had uh, agency cryptonyms. And uh, the gap of what happened uh, has never been answered. The, the men who were involved and were responsible obviously aren't speaking out, and, uh, and there's no paper to prove anything. So perhaps the same tactics were used against the civil rights movement. Heavy infiltration of the ranks, spread the seeds of dissension, then step back and let the blood spill. As I see it, Mr. Chairman, it is for this committee to be able to figure out how to persuade the people of this country that indeed it did go on. And how shall we ensure that it never happened again? But it will happen repeatedly unless we can bring ourselves to understand and accept that it did go on. And, uh, and, and I say that as one who, who worked as a United States attorney with the Bureau and have enormous respect for its capacities in the field of kidnapping, bank robbery, and a lot of other things, but am appalled uh, to learn what the, if it's correct, the intelligence side of that bureau was up to for so long. If we would like to believe that the FBI would do all this viciousness and all of these things to an individual and would stop short of killing him, then we're out of our mind. In America today, if we believe the CIA would deal with foreign assassinations and would not consider it at home, that's like saying the mafia runs crooked gambling tables in South America, but honest ones in America. It just ain't true. We've seen then how the decade of struggle ended. Many of the prominent figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were assassinated amidst an intense climate of hatred that government agencies were acutely aware of. In fact, the FBI contributed to creating 
the climate of hate. Moreover, the assassinations themselves appear to have been facilitated by an elaborate network of government and police agencies who were watching very closely every move that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were making, and then at the same time, they disappeared just as the assassinations occurred. But those were the leaders. What about the students, the troops of the movement? Well, they too were subjected to harassment. This document that you're looking at now shows how the FBI tried to divide factions within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And the Black Panther Party was also subjected to heavy, heavy surveillance. We knew the history of uh, the FBI's infiltration tactics in other organizations, particularly the American Communist Party. There was already um, a record compiled that showed that the FBI was even in charge of various branches of the Communist Party. So we understood that police tactic of infiltration. There was a situation where, in a sense, the white racism uh, was its own victim. Like, for racist reasons, uh, J. Edgar Hoover had not recruited black agents. He had a lot of white agents. And it takes time to train some black agents. In the meantime, uh, those white agents, try as they might, were not able to infiltrate our ranks because the Black Panther Party did not have any white members. Okay? And we relied upon uh, people that we knew. And we kept people that we didn't know on another level. And I think this is why um, we didn't suffer more, put it that way, because they did catch up and start a crash program of recruiting black agents, and they very quickly uh, filled that gap, but it took them about a year to do it. In the summer of 1978, I interviewed a man who worked as an informer for the FBI during the 1960s. His name is Dothard Perry, also known as Ed Riggs, also known as Bill Perry, also known as Othello. How were you paid? The pay was always in cash. Cash and you would sign a card. It would go like this. A rendezvous or a drop-off point would be picked out either by yourself or the agent. You would meet the agent there. Uh, usually it would be in a vehicle. You get in the vehicle, he would hand you the money. He would tell you first to count the money. He would tell you the amount while you counted it. If the amount was there, he would then bring out a card. On that card would be for the week of such and such. And in other words, the week was dated. So-and-so has been paid the amount of. Then you would sign the card, and then the agent would sign the card. The reason for this is that if um, all of a sudden the IRS became very interested about where you were getting all this extra money from, you could always tell them to go back to the Bureau, and the Bureau would have your cards on file. I see. Uh, were there such things as bonuses? Oh, yes. What were they paid for? Bonuses were paid for, um, suppose, while you were meeting with, um, or you were at a meeting with Bobby Seals, uh, Chulai of the Red Army happened to come to the meeting, too, which is something which would be a new development. That's, that's bonus time. In other words, a hot piece of information. Hot piece, very hot piece. Did you ever suffer pangs of conscience? Quite a few times. Quite a few times. I still suffer pangs of conscience. Uh, I suffer from the fact that a lot of people trusted me, and I misused that trust. I suffer from the fact that uh, a lot of information that I gave out was the undoing of certain groups or certain people. Uh, I suffer from the fact that uh, I'm on the run constantly. Uh, 
I have no real life to speak of. Uh, you have no family life, really? You have uh, a wife? Uh, no, I don't have a wife. I do have a child. Uh, I can't see her uh, that often. I have to stay away from them because once I come around, uh, the Bureau shows up and harassment starts. Uh, I have very few close personal friends, no one to really confide in. Uh, it's, uh, it's like being uh, on the outside of a glass jar and everything is happening inside the jar, but you're on the outside. You can see it happening, but you can't participate. Why have you decided to talk to me? Uh, for the simple reason, I think this information should be she should should be getting out should be got should be put out to the public i think not only black people but everyone should become aware of what your so-called law enforcement agencies do to so-called enforce the law uh... because between you myself and the audience uh... i've seen more felons in law enforcement than I have in prison. Many would say, well, look, you yourself just got through saying that the DLA was involved in criminal activity. What's wrong with wanting to put them in prison? How would you answer them? I would answer them in this way. Um, first off, we have to understand why they did what they did. But I'm not even going to go off into that psychological hoo-ha. What I'm going to say is, when you become just as bad as the people that you go after, then uh, <laughs> there's nothing gained and a whole lot lost. You also were active in the infiltration of uh, many cultural groups. Before we go into that step by step, how much research and study did the FBI engage in of black culture in the late 60s? A great amount. Give me an idea. Uh, from the thing is, I, I, I can, uh, they have a file on every type of magazine uh, that blacks read. They have a file on, on, on the music. Music? Uh, music, dance, theater, uh, actors, the comedians, you name it, man. And they would actually study these oh, different... Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. What would they do with music? Uh, to understand the people, you have to understand the culture. To infiltrate, you have to understand. You had a lot of so-called white liberals that were infiltrating the so-called uh, black groups using the uh, information that they had gathered from the studies of blacks. Um, you mean just to understand the behavior pattern of our people? Oh, yeah. I can, uh, you know, Will Heaton could name out some jams of Miles Davis that I hadn't even heard of. He could name off some, some books that I hadn't even read pertaining to black culture. Do you ever see agents actually studying oh, the yes. music of... Yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I have seen them going over uh, even video portion of cultural events. Uh, the understanding, like when, okay, you have an organization like uh, uh, Leroy Jones Black House. You remember that. Okay, Leroy Jones's place, which was done on the uh, thing of tribalism. I, I, that's where I first heard the word kintu, mantu, hantu, hentu. These, these words uh, of the African continuum. I, you know, I, I learned that from an agent. He ran it down to me. They make in-depth in studies of the personalities of the people they're dealing with, too, uh, uh, culturally. It always helps. When you, uh, it's a thing of you can take their culture and use it against them. How large would you say an extensive a collection on our culture would you say the FBI has? Would you... Rated as large as a particular library, like the Schomburg Library in Harlem, or...? I would rate it better. I would rate it better, and the, and the fact is that they go into details. Details that 
we probably, probably would overlook. Uh, Will Heaton used to meet me in, in different places, you Ooh. know. Will Heaton, that was one of my super, uh, supervising agents. Uh, there is a certain bar in the Los Angeles area where people into black cultural things met, and Will Heaton used to meet me there. And he would go into very long and tiring conversations with some very articulate brothers about culture, African culture, and Afro-American culture. Tell me about some of the uh, cultural organizations that you infiltrated and what you did. PASLA, Mafunde, uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which they had. The me. Watts Writers Workshop? Yes. Uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which was one of the oldest established black uh, writers' workshop. That Turn place was burned down. Yeah. Uh, the bureau had it burned down. How do you know that? I, uh, I know because I participated. I did the arson. You burned down the Watts Writers Workshop? Yes. Why did they want it to go? Uh, at the time, funding had been cut to the workshop, had been cut out, but it looked like there was a possibility of a grant being given back to the workshop. And if there was no theater, there would be no grant. How did you do it? Uh, two cans of kerosene, uh, a Purex bottle, gasoline, and a um, flare, highway flare. Why didn't you use more sophisticated stuff? Oh, no. No, 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 you, 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 you're never overly sophisticated. It's too obvious. Uh, this way you make it look like, uh, you know, maybe somebody in the neighborhood that got kicked out of theater at one time got mad and came and burned the damn theater up, that kind of thing. But you were involved in this theater? I mean, didn't it get to you at all what you were? Hey, man, that got to me a great deal. I love that theater. I built the stage. You built the stage? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I got to the workshop, uh, the stage that had been, the original stage that had been built needed an extension on it. The original part of the stage was in terrible condition. They had no lighting system. I put the lighting system in myself. I put the stage in myself. And that was a stage, man. And that, that was a theater. It's a nice theater. Who was the director of that workshop? Harry Dolan. Harry Dolan. Some very, very uh, well-known artists supported that workshop, gave some money very, to it. Some very well-known artists came out of the Watts Writers Workshop. You know, uh, Glenn uh, Tubman, uh, uh, Yapik Koto, uh, Sidney Poirier used to come down there and give a class. Sammy Davis Jr. used to come down there all the time. Uh, Quincy Jones used to come there and give music classes. We had our own eight-track studio set up for uh, um, sound. We had our own sound room there. Was part of your other activities and responsibilities to uh, study the profiles of celebrities who were supportive of uh, organizations? Definitely, and especially, like I said, the psychological backgrounds, weaknesses and strengths. Did he have a weakness for blondes? Did he have a weakness for money? Did he snort cocaine? Uh, did he smoke marijuana? Uh, uh, they even get into, oh, and that's, that's one thing the Bureau loves is their sexual background. Uh, they have files and files on different blacks, not only celebrities, but a lot of others, uh, sexual activity. What would they do with this information? Oh, that's used as a weakness. So they would feed these to these weaknesses? Yes. Did you see that happen? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Doc Holliday, uh, who uh, is the, one of the leaders of the BGF, Black Gorilla Family, which is a prison gang, and the uh, California state prison system. Upon his release from prison, uh, a certain sister, uh, 
made herself known to him at a nightclub. Whereupon uh, he moved in with her and she picked up names, telephone numbers, information, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that lasted for a good three and a half months. Was this an unusual thing, or did this oh, no. happen often? No, that, that happens all the time. Did you yourself get involved in doing that? Yes. Give me an example. Uh, there was a gentleman that was on trial in Los Angeles that belonged to the BLA that had been busted in a southern state for a bank robbery, but was brought with two other people to Los Angeles to stand trial for the machine gunning of a police officer in Los Angeles. I was supposed to warm my way into the infections of his sister and uh, whatever it took to get the information that I needed as far as what kind of defense they planned to use as, as to turn this information over to the federal prosecution. Did you do it? Uh, I got the information and thank God I didn't have to go through with uh, uh, the actual thing of sexual activity. What do you mean, thank God? Uh, the sister was rather unappealing. How did you justify to the organizations in which you had infiltrated yourself that you were living on an $800 a week stipend or on an $800 a week standard of living when most of them were living hand to mouth? Well, hey, brother, you know, uh, I'm hustling, you know. I mean, hey, man, <laughs> you know, so a little of this on the side, a little of that on the side, you know, I get over, you know, that kind of thing. In other words, ain't nobody's business but mine where I get the money. So, uh, you know, everybody took it for granted that I was possibly doing a little dealing on the side, that kind of thing. Hmm. Then also, uh, uh, everybody liked me for the simple reason that I would do things that I didn't have to do. I would go out of my way. You know, like Mafundi would have a pageant and they needed someone to do the sound setup for him. And I'd say, of course, I'll do it for you. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I was very well liked at one time in the community. Would you say to American citizens that this situation of surveillance and infiltration continues to this day? Oh, yes. On the dimension that you experienced? Probably much larger by now. Larger? Oh, yeah. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me put it to you like this. Each year, everything gradually escalated up more and more. So I figured uh, when I left, it, it didn't stop escalating. As they say, one monkey does not stop anybody's show. You mentioned Sammy Davis Jr., who at one time, uh, it was reported, gave money uh, to the Black Panther Party, I believe. Uh, were you ever assigned to look into that? Yes, I was, uh, I was told to uh, try to get as close to Mr. Davis or to anyone in his office as I could. I used to go up and have real chit-chat, chummy-chummy conversation with his personal secretary, Ann, at the 9000 building on Sunset. And I used to bring a Porter Pack video camera, and I used to go around and I would videotape the whole office. You mean celebrities would be coming into his office and you'd film them freely? Oh, yeah. Didn't they question that? I'm from the Ross Writers Workshop. Yeah, right on, brother. You know, that kind of thing. No questions asked. Same thing with the NAACP Image Awards. You know, uh... They were very interested in people like Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, um, there was a uh, another black uh, in Los Angeles that they were very interested in because uh, not Los Angeles, but in Sacramento, Nathaniel Colley, who's attorney for the NAACP, and I know Nat, and uh, they wanted information on him just for the simple reason that he's an attorney for the NAACP which makes no sense to me, but may, must make a lot of sense to them because they use the information. You've been called upon to testify in Washington. Before who? Uh, before the Senate committee. I was called first to testify before the church committee. Uh, and I did go to Washington, D.C. I did testify to those people. 
And I want to say right now that uh, the committee was full of smack. They got loads and loads of information and didn't even use it, didn't release it. Um, they, I had tapes that I offered to them in evidence against the Federal Bureau of Investigation with conversations of me and my supervising officer uh, where he's telling me to obtain certain articles for him by stealing. Don't get fingerprints on it. We can really use that. Uh, did you take the weapons over to such and such? Uh, the Church's Committee told me that um, they couldn't use the tapes because uh, the tapes were gotten by illegal means. What would you say about the composition of the committee panel that questioned you? Uh, I can say that's for the birds, too, because the same people that I was talking about were the same people on the, on, on, on the panel with the Church's Committee. What do you mean? When I came in the room to be interviewed by the so-called people from the Church's Committee, uh, the representatives from the Federal Bureau of Investigation were also in the room. FBI agents were a member of the Church Committee panel? Uh, they were there with the investigators for the Church's Committee asking questions just like the Church's Committee. And see, this is another thing that I, I find fault with, and this is another reason why I am not going to Washington, D.C., is that, again, I have been asked to come again for the second time. I am not going again for the simple reason that when I went up there, I went up there with the idea that there were agencies investigating the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigating itself. You're on the lam almost. Um, do you have a sense that you're going to be arrested and go to prison? Oh, yeah, eventually. Eventually, when things come to a head, it has to. It has to be that way. No other way around it. What would you say to citizens who sit and listen to what you've said and have a sense of frustration and helplessness? There are some agents, the old line agents, that disagree with the tactics that were used during the so-called COINTEL period. But one thing I don't want us to jump off of is that People always talk about, they're talking about COINTEL now so heavily. Uh, I'm not talking about COINTEL, I'm talking about a thing called BD, which was better known as Black Desk. The Black Desk was set up for a simple thing of infiltrating black organizations and black groups, whatever. Where was this Black Desk, or were there a number of them? There were a number of Black Desks, but the head Black Desk was in Washington, D.C., controlled by Sullivan. And the was he black? No. Mm -hmm. And what was the function of the black desks all over the country? I guess there were dozens. Uh, to, the function of the black desk was to monitor activity, social unrest, revolutionary groups, cultural groups, and such in the black community. And feed it into this central yes. desk. And it still exists. As far as I know, yes. We've seen a number of investigations into the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. We've seen an extended police trial of the assassination of Malcolm X. What you seem to say substantiates what many black people say out on the street, that government agents or agencies knew that these assassinations were brewing and either participated in them or allowed them to take place. It would behoove black people, it would behoove all people, really, to question uh, so-called the cut-and-dry uh, <laughs> one lone assassin theory. Uh, the Bureau and other intelligence agencies are very good at conspiracies. They are very good at setting people up to be killed. They are very good at making innuendo so the person will be killed. City police don't know about because they have policemen in there. They don't let black people form anything without some policemen in there. And while I was in the black Muslim movement, over the black Muslim movement, many of the police who were sent to infiltrate us, they're black, would tell me, say, look, I'm a cop, but I have to come. They would tell me. I knew the, 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 the Muslim movement was full of police. So don't you think anything is going down that they don't know about? The only thing that goes down is what they want to go down. And what they don't want to go down, they don't let it go down. Something else was used against the students that drove the final nails into the coffin. 
killing the movement. What stopped it, of course, uh, almost dead in its track, and not by any accident, was a widespread and deliberately organized, he deliberately organized widespread use of drugs. The fact that a decision was made, and I think uh, you, most of you familiar with the broadcast of the mafia uh, defector who uh, went on uh, public media to uh, to declare what happened and outline in great detail the great plan of how to destroy the black youth of the nation, starting in New York. He said in a meeting 20 miles outside of New York City, the great decision was made. He said he didn't have to guess about it, and I... I those who heard him uh, know that I'm quoting him almost verbatim because uh, he was there. And the decision was to concentrate the distribution of drugs on the black youth of the nation starting in New York. Starting in New York beginning in the elementary school, and that to punish, even on the pain of death, any of the distributors who invaded the white community or predominantly white schools. That New York and other large cities were to be divided up into districts. The district commander, black, was to be given any kind of car he wanted, Mercedes, uh, Rolls Royce, anything, because this would be a part of the sales pitch. That blacks just love fine cars, and he'd drive around through the community in his fine car, and some of his key assistants and he'd be identified, he'd be known, and that sort of stuff. And so it, I, I, the stories, I'm not going to farther into it. But thus it began, and the spread over the country, and we fell for it. Now, one, one, one thing was, was important, that the thing to attract the blacks, more than any other thing, more than the drug itself, but to spread the word, have a number of key young people in it, and spread the word that this is the end thing. So that'll get them. Just say it's the end thing, and they'll brave the fires of hell to be a part of the end thing. So that's our story of the decade of struggle. We put together this film to pay particular homage and tribute to the extraordinary young people of that era and we give the story to our young people of today in particular in the hope that they'll stop and think about much of the negativism that they're caught up in nowadays and try to understand why.